Hello, welcome back to April Space 10.3. Bring in the clouds. We are back. Yes. Um, so one thing I realized with this countdown is that how what did it start at? Like twenty six days? Uh, it was like twenty two. So that's how many days passed in peace before the events of the end of Arc Nine, right? That's right. We are like in between Arc Nine Sec Penultimate and Ultimate Chapters. Yeah. So what were they doing during that month? They were uh, recuperating and getting stuff ready to head to Elysian Fields. They were having the Hot Springs episode. Yeah. <laughs> we will never see it. You have to buy the light novel. Yeah. Alright. Well, we're not here for that. We're here for Arc 10 now, so let me begin. <clears throat> Seventeen days before Avaman's attack. Atoy Muzazi's fists shook with rage as he looked at the grim hologram above. It was a display of the aftermath on the planet Ipsum, the site of a special officer supply station. Two bodies were slumped on the ground. The officers who had been attacked, while the bearded man orated silently, the hologram muted for this replay. The things this man had declared were scandalous, but Muzazi's mind was focused entirely on those two sad bodies. Who are they? he asked. Gretchen, who was operating the projector, followed his gaze. The officers? She checked her script. Uh... Blair Trace and Duel McMalloy, serving special officers for three years now. Once the enemy sent this message to Commissioner Caesar, a medical ship was dispatched from the nearest light point. Trace was dead at the scene, and McMalloy is in critical condition. To lose one's partner in circumstances like this, Muzazi's heart went out to Duel McMalloy. If he woke up, he would experience that same unbearable despair. I assume he's saying the same one that he had yeah. experienced. This emergency meeting had been oh no, Sorry. <laughs> had been called in the middle of the night cycle. Sorry, uh, among us brained. The seven blades had gathered in this briefing chamber to view the message that Caesar had forwarded to them. As a matter that concerned the status of the Supreme Heir, this was something under their jurisdiction alone. All the same, Zazi couldn't help but notice that the heir herself wasn't present. He wasn't sure how appro Sorry. He wasn't sure how appropriate that was. On the hologram, the speaker's silent speech reached its climax once again, and he revealed the golden-cloaked child, declaring him the true supreme heir. Balte reached over to the projector, pausing it just as the child stepped into view. Is this Balte speaking? Uh, yeah. The more important question, I think, he mused, is who is he? No, is who is he? Was that Bolte's voice? Uh, no, I don't know. It was a little less anime protagonist thing. Just a, just a little best, a bit less. Yeah. The more important question, I think, he mused, is who is he? That's it. Edward rubbed his beard. Is that the old guy? Yeah. It could be anyone. A street urchin snatched from a street corner, maybe? Dressed up in that gaudy cloak to add a sense of authority? This is nonsense! Ioneer Yggdras Yggdrasil creaked in the corner. If that was meant to be some kind of contribution to the conversation, nobody acknowledged it. And if Ioneer took offense to that, he didn't show it. He simply continued to stand silently, right next to the similarly mute Mariana Panelios. They made quite the pair. Muzazi sighed, looking down from the hologram. I have to agree with Mr. Grace. I don't see why these ruffians bringing out some random child is a cause for concern. There's no proof that the boy has any qualifications to become supreme heir. Valte circled the hologram, inspecting the recorded scene from every angle. "'You recognize this man?' he asked, nodding towards the bearded leader. "'I don't know,' Musasi shook his head. "'Should I?' "'That's Han—' "'Oh, that's Hans Alir!' Gretchen said, sh scrolling through his script. "'Is it Alir or Allier?' "'Uh, Ali, Allier, uh, yeah.' "'Allier, you said?' "'Allier.' "'Allier, okay.' Former cult underpunk musician. Emphasis on cult. He talked a huge number of his fans into a mass suicide, believing they'd go to the afterlife he talked about in his songs. They drank poison, he drank water, and just walked away. This is a guy who knows how to get listened to. He'll gather support. Mor That's a weird way to phrase that. Uh, Morgan was sitting some distance away, lounging as he listened into the conversation. Quite the scumbag, then. What about the other two? He's a little less... He's not, he, he wasn't quite that gruff. Don't he fucking... You have like too many... He was more like this. He was a little bit... Why do you have to make me He's do a little every bit saucy, voice? Because you're the one reading. Why don't you do some voices, huh? It's hard to remember. I do the voices when I read it. <laughs> no, you don't. 
Okay. <clears throat> You're right. I just I like to have that. I actually have a ton of the AI voice that I make do the impressions. What about the other two? Bald guys of Victor Yoon, Gretchen continued, flicking his image up as a secondary hologram. Big time bank robber, until he tried hitting the military bank on Nax. The girl goes by the name Nin, high class assassin for hire. Uh, I don't want to drag it, but I want to make a comment here real quick so I can go back to this. Oh, fuck, I don't know how to make a comment. Whatever. Um, can you highlight this? Well, I love how you did this. There you go. Way better. <clears throat> Quite the eclectic bunch, Balte grunted. The only thing they have in common, Gretchen concluded, is that they were all being held in cryogenic confinement at Gray State Orbital Penitentiary Center until two months ago. The systems malfunction, unfreeze the three of them, and they break out. No idea where the kid came from. This little gang has made some minor appearances since, Edward picked up, hands clasped behind his back. But only minor matters. Starship theft, minor robberies, killing a special officer of the supremacy is beyond the pale. How is a starship theft a minor matter? Well, not, Aren't they, like, super expensive? Well, not, like, personal ones. I mean, like, when he says starship theft, it's basically like, he took my car. Help. You told me that starships were not like cars, and they were super rare in another chapter. Because I remember asking you about that. Well, it depends on the starship. I was like, are starships like cars where everyone has one, or are they like a big doesn't mean that everyone has them. It's like not everyone owns a truck either, though. I, I guess. All right, Tan. I'm fucking looking at you. I'm, I'm, I'm peering through the inconsistencies, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm staring into your soul, man. <clears throat> I'm staring with my eyes. <laughs> Balte looked up into the cold eyes of the man frozen in time above him. It's a statement, he said. They want to show us they're serious. The Supreme Air was produced through artificial insemination after decades of the body negotiating with the Supreme. Aklama's never even met her father. Given her difficulties, there have been misgivings raised about her position in the past, but we, uh... He tapped his hand against a sheathed blade. We quashed them. But if there's a viable alternative heir, one that's even slightly plausible, people will start picking sides. It'll get messy. I don't like the idea of the Supreme, like, jacked off into a fucking <laughs> vial. He's like, I'm done. Jeez, stop bothering that's me. That's exactly what happens. <laughs> <laughs> that's so gross. <clears throat> so what do we do, oh, Capitan? Morgan snarked, raising an eyebrow. Malte closed his eyes, and when he opened them again, his gaze was firm. We eliminate them. All of these so-called kingmakers. We track them down and crush them with enough force that nobody else will think of pulling the same trick. Muzazi leaned over the table, a worrisome thought on his own mind. Why do they care, though? Isn't that kind of how the Supreme works anyways? Like, fight to be the strongest? Yeah, but they Why do have they a care vested he... interest in um, their person being the strongest. Right, I suppose that's fair, yeah. <clears throat> the boy, though, he indicated the child in the golden cloak. What about him? He's clearly being used by these people. What happens to him? Behind Balte, El Edward blinked. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, he said quietly, but his eyes told another story. The dark mood was lifted in an instant as the hologram flickered away and the room returned to normal lighting. Morgan squinted as he rose to his feet, eyes robbed of the darkness they'd just become accustomed to. Balte slapped his hands together as if cleaning away the unpleasant thoughts that had broiled around in the space. At any rate... He declared. We'll have tracking automatics dispatched to close in on their current location. As soon as the Kingmakers make a move, we'll head to intercept. In the meantime, Balte's eyes drifted over to Muzazi, and a moment later he realized that all the eyes of the Seven Blades were on him. What? he asked, glancing around cautiously. You're a new member, a toy, Gretchen grinned. There are traditions we've got to honor here, you know. Indeed, Edward nodded. But what about the Kingmakers? Musazi pressed, with more than a hint of desperation. Shouldn't we focus on them? Like Mr. Kojiro said, this is a dire threat! It is, it is, Balte said reassuringly, stepping over and slapping a hand on Musazi's shoulder. But we can't do anything about it yet. We have to keep our minds on what's in front of us, Atoy. Musazi furrowed his brow. And what is in front of us, sir? Balte grinned. Your welcome reception, of course. Do you own a suit? Oh. Oh, dear. Wait, so does the Supremacy, by the way... Because Muzazi's whole thing was pursuing Dragon because the Supremacy believed he was a criminal. Like, do they just not care anymore? Well, it's not that big of a deal. Is it? Muzazi was so focused on it because he was the guy who got shot in the back. 
but it's not like right. immediate. We don't, we, run, we have, do not have death squads out for Dragon. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah, he's he's like low priority. Yeah. He only really mattered on the one planet. I see. Okay. Uh, a toy Muzazi adjusted his bow tie. Then he adjusted it again and again. Finally, accepting that it would never look good on him, he removed his hands and left to its imperfection. Frowning, he looked at himself in the mirror. I assume left into yes, its I imperfection. Was about that. Uh, this was the first time he'd work a tuxedo. Worn a tux- work it, girl. <laughs> work it, girl. This is the first time he'd worn a tuxedo, and, and that's why I didn't know if that was intentional or not. That's why I was like, I'm not sure. <laughs> like, never uh, seen that. <laughs> this was the first time he'd worn a tuxedo, and he'd already decided that it would be the last. The black suit with its white trim made him look somewhat like an uncomfortable penguin. Besides the sheath on his hip, nothing about the person he was looking at felt like him. Satisfactory? queried the automatic that had brought him the clothes, its many thin arms twitching in the air. Satisfactory, Musazi echoed, nodding, and the automatic scurried out of the closet. Apart from the seven blades and the heir herself, the child garden had no crew. All maintenance and custodial matters were handled by a legion of automatic servants, with an auto brain directing the ship's flight path. That won't pop. Uh, pop. Blah, 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 blah. Never mind. <laughs> that won't cause a problem, I'm sure, is what I meant to say. Uh, it gave the ship something of a lonely feeling. From what he'd heard, even the Shisha had a bigger crew than this. Muzazi's frown deepened as he stared at himself in the mirror. The suit was one thing, but the very fact that it could even entertain the idea of having a party was another thing entirely. Their fellow special officers were dying in the field, and in response they'd be sipping drinks and swapping gossip. None of it sat ri- sat at all with him. Sorry, none of it sat right at all with him. Neither did this bow tie. He reached up and tore it free with a grunt, tossing the resultant mess of fabric onto the floor. A cleaning automatic hurriedly devoured it. He sighed. He could throw his tantrums all he liked, but Mizazi knew that he didn't have the authority to actually change anything that was happening yet. The reception would go ahead, and that would be the end of it. All he could do was grit his teeth and endure. From what Muzazi had been told, all sorts would be showing up for this party. Other prominent special officers, members of the body, Ascendant General Toll, and even one of the contenders, from what he understood. Countless people, who no doubt had more important things to do. Muzazi did not relish the idea of being the centerpiece of a gathering like that. At any rate, he could only stand here and grouch about it for so long. The guests were already in the process of boarding. He'd seen them earlier, out of the window that took up an entire wall of his living quarters. A plethora of small, personal ships, connecting themselves to the child garden with long extensions like umbilical cords. Uh, Not even the Ascendant General had come in a warship. No doubt that could be perceived as a threat to the Supreme Heir. No doubt they had defenses hovering just outside of scanner range, though, ready to swoop in at the first sign of danger. They were not careless people. Oh, sorry, these were not careless people. Muzazi was pulled out of his thoughts by a tap-tap-tap from the door. From beyond it, Gretchen called out, You ready there, Toy? There are people waiting for you, you know. He sighed. This was just another unpleasant task that had to be dealt with. Best to get it over with as quickly as possible. I'm ready, he replied, opening the door and stepping out. Which way to the function room? Gretchen, who had changed into a simple red dress, raised an eye at his ruffled collar and absent bow tie. You, uh, you all right there, Toy? she asked. You're kind of missing... It's fashion, Muzazi interrupted. Shall we go? They walked down the hallways, side by side, the sights and sounds of the jungle surrounding them. As they made their way towards the ship's function room, Muzazi found himself glancing down at the small woman beside him. It was a little disconcerting that he seemed to have been given a chaperone, but he supposed he was the guest of honor at this party. It wouldn't do for him to get lost. I I need quick water. No problem. (laughs) He's like a fucking plant. (laughs) It's been a while since... (laughs) <laughs> iron it's been what wait hold on what are you saying <laughs> you need a watering can you're fucking iron here. that's me I need to grow into a nice healthy tree it's been a while since such a crowd showed up you know Gretchen spoke up chirpily the ascendant general is a dutiful kind of guy so he always makes an appearance but the clown of the supremacy too are you a big deal or something a toy she chuckled to herself as if some private joke the clown of the supremacy Wu Ming is here Musazi asked, surprised. He hadn't seen that man since the events of Nocturnus. That seemed so very long ago now. Gretchen nodded. "Mm Mm-hmm. He didn't even show up for Morgan's reception. So you really are a lucky boy. I bet Morgan is really sore about it, huh? Musazi furrowed his brow. How so? Well, 
Gretchen looked up at him, the sly smile of gossip on her lips. Morgan's the clown's apprentice, you know? Ming taught the guy how to fight, how to use Aether. There are even rumors, and you didn't hear this from me, that Ming got Morgan a spot in the blades. So he could even be a spy, you know? I suppose. Despite his recent experiences with Jean Lyons in the GID, espionage wasn't especially Musazi's arena, so we couldn't comment on that. But uh, Morgan Knox did seem the type. Balte's probably sore too, she continued, voice low. He was expecting Paradise Karen to show up, you know? But he gets the clown. Funny. This conversation was quickly growing uncomfortable. Judging from the dark look on Gretchen's face and the bitterness in her voice, she seemed like the one who was sore, but Muzazi didn't speak that thought aloud. It would be unacceptably rude, after all, and there was always the possibility he was misinterpreting something. Anyway, Gretchen brightened up as they turned the corner. Function room's right through here. Everyone's already waiting for you, so you just need to give a little speech and... Ooh. The doors to the function room were certainly in front of them, but standing before them, blocking their path through the hallway, was Mariana Panhelios. Her face was hidden behind that same dark veil, and her black war robes brushed against the floor. She certainly hadn't gotten changed for the party. If nothing else, though, her intention seemed clear. She'd positioned herself right in the middle of the hallway. She definitely intended to impede their path. But why? Uh, Mariana? Gretchen ventured, looking pale as she glanced away. Could you move? Mariana did not move. Mariana did not speak. It was hard to tell because of the veil, but from the angle of her head, she surely must have been staring at them. The rose smell of her pungent perfume filled the hall filled the hallway. Oh, sorry. The rose smell of her pungent perfume filled the hallway. Gretchen tugged at Musazi's sleeve. Probably best if we go another way. <laughs> she laughed nervously. We can go back at that junction and just take the long way around. Musazi frowned. Was the prospect of squeezing past her own teammate really so frightening? And for that matter, why was Mariana choosing to block their path? The whole situation was bizarre. He stepped forward, ignoring Gretchen's squeak of alarm, and extended his hand. I don't believe we've spoken yet, Miss Panhelios. I'm sure you know this, but my name is Atoy Muzazi. Slowly, Mariana cocked her head, as if the words Muzazi had spoken were somehow confusing. The handshake Muzazi offered went unreciprocated. His frown deepened. May I ask why you're blocking our way? He continued. There was no answer. May we pass? He narrowed his eyes, finally becoming just a little bit aggravated at the silence. There was no answer, but a moment later, Mariana stepped out of the way. Her movement was exceedingly graceful and utterly silent, black robes swaying like a banner in the air. Even as she moved, though, the direction of her head did not change, and so she looked off instead into empty space. Oh, she's like a dead puppet being controlled or some shit right now. Muzazi wasn't sure what exactly to make of that, but he wasn't one to forget his manners. Thank you, he nodded respectfully before stepping past her. As expected, there was no answer. Gretchen glanced nervously back at the stationary Mary at the stationary Mariana as they reached the doors. Jeez, I should really tell Balte she's wandering around out here, she muttered before turning to the doors as well. Anyway, anyway, we're finally here. Ready to make your speech? Muzazi grimly nodded. He'd never been one for oration, but he'd give it his best shot. The doors slid open. Muzazi took a bitter gulp of his drink, scratching his uncomfortable clothes as he sat at the table in the back of the function room. What a disaster that had been. Some of the most prominent individuals in the supremacy right in front of him, and all he'd been able to manage were a few terse words about doing his duty. He ran a hand back through his hair, made moist by sweat. If nothing else, he supposed, he'd been honest. He was a terse sort of man. Anything too extravagant would have been giving off a misleading impression. All the same, he couldn't help but feel the crawl of embarrassment as he ran his eyes over the milling guests. Prominent special officers like Dariah Todd ha Harlow... Yeah, Dariah Todd Harlow, the commissioner's aide, along with members of the body and military both. Wait, what? What? Hold on, what, what was that sentence? Prominent special officers like this person, along with members of the body and the military both. What, right, but there was no... Hold on, I'm confused. Prominent special officers like Dariah Todd Harlow, the commissioner's aide, along with members of the body and military both. As its own sentence. Yeah. I get it's a continuation of the last one, but it just it feels a little weird to me, but alright. Uh, he humiliated himself in front of them. Then, of course, there was the biggest guest of all, literally. Ascendant General Toll, the commander of the Supremacy's military, second to only in rank to the Supreme himself. 
he was as pugnant as pugnant gets, his hair a bright red and his eyes resplendent gold. He even had the slit pupils, which were so rare these days. Don't they have, like, aren't they, like, big, big, yeah. too? He's a big why is Gretchen so? Why is Gretchen so small? Is she, like, half pugnant? Well, it's just, like, some people are more pugnant. Interesting. But, like, big, big's, like, eight, nine feet, yeah. right? They're like, yeah, okay. His hair had been cut short with military precision. The lone survivor being the bushy red mustache that hung over his lip. Oh, I know the exact fit you're going for here. <laughs> he towered over every other guest, equal in height to the inhuman Ioneer Yggdrasil. His white military suit and flowing cape making him seem like a marching parade all by himself. Muzazi had heard stories about the Ascendant General using a shotgun as a pistol, and looking at the beast of a man, he could believe it. He seemed to have made himself scarce at some point, though, and the other guests had quickly lost interest in Muzazi. They were fussing quite a bit over the air in her frilly white dress, though, paying their respects with opportunistic eyes. It was all Edward Grace at her side could do just to keep them in an orderly line. It was quickly becoming clear to Muzazi that this reception wasn't for him, exactly. It was just an excuse for them all to come together. Soft piano music swam throughout the room, providing an impromptu soundtrack to the murmurs of conversation. The partygoers had split off into their little groups, speaking quietly to each other, automatic servers ferrying food and drink to and fro. Like the hallways, the walls of the function room were displaying a false environment, a hedge maze stretching off in every direction, right into the horizon. Muzazi glanced to the side, just in time to see a man he didn't recognize approach his table. Uh, not much of a speechmaker, are you, Miser Muzazi? the man said. He was pale, with high cheekbones and a pair of red eyes that looked more than a little bloodshot. His blue suit hung limply off his thin frame, and he'd brought his own drink, although it seemed he'd taken a whole bottle rather than a glass. He fell into the chair next to Muzazi, without waiting for permission, taking a swig of his drink. "'I suppose not,' Muzazi said, shifting in his seat uncomfortably. "'And you are?' "'Ion Stenhouse,' the man grinned, offering a long-fingered hand. "'Body Special Envoy.' Muzazi accepted the handshake, noting that the other man seemed to put no strength at all into the motion. A pleasure. I'm afraid I'm not familiar with the special envoy. It's a big nothing of a job. <laughs> Stenhouse laughed, clicking his long fingers against his glass. Mostly ferrying messages back and forth between the two branches, working things out logistics-wise between the body and the military. Not much to write home about, but it's enough to get me into sources of free booze like this. I see. Muzazi wasn't sure what, if anything, he was supposed to say in response to that. How about you, though? Stenhouse leaned back in his chair, planting his feet on the table before them. Seven blades of the turning of the air. That's something, huh? You're nervous? All I can do is my best, Muzazi replied stoically. Whether I fail or succeed is down to myself alone. Nervousness doesn't come into it. Well, Stenhouse took another swig, giving Muzazi the distinct feeling his answer hadn't been listened to. So long as you don't defect, you're doing better than old Lucifer Westmore. You can take some solace there, huh? I'm afraid I'm not familiar with that name. Morgan Nacht's predecessor, Stenhouse went to indicate the man himself, only to stop when he realized he wasn't present. No surprise you don't know him. He wasn't here long. He ditched the supremacy for the UAP. Then I hear he ditched the UAP for something else. Rush was pissed. Muzazi raised an eyebrow. You knew Negan Rush? Sure. Stenhouse threw his arms back as he lounged. I've been part of these circles for a good long while. Miser Muzazi. I'm familiar with all the big faces. A good friend to have, don't you think? What sort of person was he? Muzazi asked. The hallucinations he'd experienced, which thankfully seemed to have subsided, had given Negan Rush some negative associations in his mind. But for a long time, Muzazi had idolized the man. His strength, his humility, his skill with the sword. But he'd become aware recently that appearances could be deceiving. He couldn't help but feel doubt, even about the things he'd once treasured most. Had the person he'd looked up to really existed? Steinhouse frowned, but kept talking all the same. What kind of person? Well, he was an idealistic sort of guy. Guys like that, generally, are either naive or crazy. Funny thing, though. Most of those guys, you get situations where they're willing to bend their ideals, or, or they break, you get me? Not him, Musasi asked. Nope. The word popped out playfully from between Stenhouse's lips. 
This guy's idols didn't bend or break. They just smashed right through everything else. Incorruptible, I'd say. It was terrifying. Terrifying? It was as he furrowed his brow. I can't see how that would be terrifying. Stenhouse chuckled, raising his hands up and down his body. Look at me, pal, he said, voice low. I am the corrupt. There wasn't a moment that guy was looking at me where he didn't want to cut my head off. I see. Well, Muzazi couldn't pretend that this Ion Stenhouse was a pleasant person to speak to. He didn't know if he would go that far. There was a lull in the conversations of the crowd, and Muzazi turned his head to look to the source. It was immediately obvious. Mariana Panhelio seemed to have come back from the hallway. The veiled woman was walking across the room, her footsteps so light that it seemed as though she was gliding. She cut right through the crowd itself, interrupting conversations and knocking drinks out of hands. A swarm of cleaning automatics scurried after her, cleaning up the collateral damage. Oh, Stenhouse followed Muzazi's gaze. Now there's a tragedy. Is this just like the exposition <laughs> this guy? This is Mr. Dark Souls. <laughs> I know it's some treasure is Muzazi. <laughs> I'm a fucked up little guy. Oh, Muzazi kept his the eyes story fi- of King Sad Guy. <laughs> <laughs> Muzazi kept his eyes fixed on Mariana as she took up a guard position at the far wall. Balte detached himself from a conversation with a minister and stepped over to her, whispering something in her ear. In response, she simply clasped her pale hands. What do you mean? he asked. Well, everyone's heard the rumors, Stenhouse grinned, leaning over the back of his chair. She used to be real close with old Negan Rush. Real, real close, if you catch my drift. Real, 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 yes, Musazi snapped, finally losing a bit of his patience. I understand the implication. If Stenhouse took offense at Musazi's anger, he did not show it. He just kept right on talking. Well, back in the day, Negan Rush and Balte Kojiro had their little duels all the time. Nothing serious, just testing their own skills or whatever. Until one day, Negan Rush ends up dead. And if you believe the gossip, Stenhouse snickered. (laughs) She was on Balte's side when it happened. She fought alongside him. Nah, nah, Stenhouse shook his head. But she was Balte's cheerleader, not Negan's, if you believe the talk. So how she's gotten... So how's she's... There you go. So now she's... What? Sorry. That's also messed up. So now she's got a nice mixture of guilt and grief. Perfect recipe for a nutcase. Like I said, real tragedy. As Muzazi looked at Mariana, standing so still, and listened to Stenhouse's cruel words, hot anger flooded through his veins. He himself had been... He himself had been adrift in the sea of grief not so long ago. He had no right to judge how someone else traversed it, and neither did anyone else. Muzazi cast his glare towards Stenhouse. I don't think there's anything perfect about that worm, he said, standing up. And it's clear that I was right. This isn't the place I'm suited for. I belong on the battlefield, not some ballroom. Stenhouse's face changed. All the gluttony and lust, you, <laughs> and contempt drained from it, leaving a slack expression. The closest thing to emotion was the slightest trace of mocking pity. The face one made when looking at a child who had said something very, very stupid. A shiver went down Muzazi's spine. This was not a person he was looking at. This was the face of statecraft. Oh, miser Muzazi, Ian Stenhouse said quietly, his voice a blank. A uh, blank slate, maybe? Yeah. Uh, you don't think you're on the battlefield? The babbling of the party went on un- uninterrupted. Uzazi stared for a few long moments into Stenhouse's empty eyes, and then, without really thinking about it, found himself forced to walk away. He didn't belong here. Uh, popcorn. Sure. <clears throat> Uzazi left the noise and lights of the party behind him, wandering off through the hallways of the child garden. He passed through virtual volcanoes and forests, deserts and springs, without any particular goal in mind. His ma- his thoughts were in just as much turmoil as his body. Well, God damn, I already said thoughts. I'll later. change it. No, I, I can't you. change it to that, though, because I would say thoughts a second later. Oh, you're right. 
His, oh, well, I'll swap them around. His thoughts are in just as much turmoil as his body. Mind leaping at Mind that. leaping. Yeah. yeah. Mind leap. It's way better. New ability. <laughs> as he searches New world order. Destination. Blur Trace. Joel McMalloy. One rotting in a coffin, the other comatose in a hospital bed. Perhaps Miss McMalloy had already woken up. Perhaps he was weeping and gnashing his teeth, cursing his own powerlessness. And what of the ones who should have been avenging him? Laughing, drinking, eating, dancing, entertaining, lowering themselves to games of words and insinuation, dishonesty and secrets. And as he couldn't help but feel the tuxedo he was wearing was some disgusting parasite clinging to his skin. Eventually, intentionally or not, he could not say, because as he found himself as at the arena. The room was even emptier than usual, the stands burr, the arena itself a burr patch of um, <laughs> God damn it, a mere patch of land. The lights, of course, were already on. After all, emptier didn't mean empty. Alexandria's tall. Maybe, Sorry? Maybe, st maybe stark patch of land? Because yeah, mirror makes it seem like it's nothing. Yeah. After all, emptier didn't mean empty. Alexandria's toll, send in general of the supremacy, smoked a cigarette as he looked down at the empty arena. It was just as if he was spectating an imaginary battle, his golden eye observing thoughtfully as opposing wills clashed. He nodded to Muzazi as he entered. So you're the man, he said, taking a weary drag. A toy Muzazi. You're not quite what I expected. Even in his days, Muzazi bowed respectfully. And what did you expect, sir? A talker, the Ascendant General sniffed. Can't stand talkers. You're doing well in that regard, officer. What are you doing here? The stereotype surrounding Pugnance was generally one of boisterousness and simplicity, but Toll gave quite the opposite impression. His voice was soft, almost quiet, and the look in his eyes suggested some great thoughtfulness that eluded conventional understanding. Even so, every word he spoke was a command. Toll, a guest, had just asked what business a person living in a child garden had wandering its halls, and Muzazi had found it perfectly natural. In fact, he found himself instinctively straightening up. The party didn't agree with me, I'm afraid, Muzazi said, descending the stairs to join Toll. Too many... talkers. I think I agree with you about them. Toll chuckled, one hand planted on the railing. He looked as if he could crush it with just the simplest application of force. Job isn't what you expected, is it? Lying did not even occur to his homie Zazi. He shook his head. No, sir. And what did you expect, Officer Muzazi? Toll tossed his spent cigarette onto the floor and a cleaning automatic snatched it up. Muzazi squeezed his hands. Something of substance, I expected. Assisting in the development of the supremacy's next era, taking things that were wrong and making them right. Not all of this politicking. Toll's eyes seemed to twinkle gold in the dim light as he regarded Muzazi. A dance is inescapable at this level of government, I'm afraid. The body has itself wrapped around this place like a vine. We have to play their games. But why? Because as he ran an exhausted hand down his face. I thought the supremacy was about strength. Strength of character, if nothing else. But these people advance through secret alliances and blackmail and bribery and spies. So much talk of spies. Who's spying for who? Who should be friends with who? It's exhausting. God, Muzazi just like me, for real. <laughs> with the delicacy of a man who'd long ago learned the measure of his strength, Toll took another tiny cigarette out and put it to his lips. There was the slightest spark of orange afer, and when it cleared, the cigarette was lit. What I'm about to say, Toll spoke softly, may seem slightly treasonous, Satori Muzazi. Muzazi swallowed. Then perhaps it's best if you don't say it. Probably. But the fact of the matter is that, although I count the Supreme as a dear comrade, I cannot deny what he has become. Slothful. Indolent. The body wields so much influence now because he has allowed them to snatch it up. He is happy to let them run his nation for him. He is the strongest, Rizali said carefully, wondering whether this was some sort of test. That is his right. Of course it is, Tor replied automatically. But the results are as you see. The body breaking free from the traditional role as facilitators in assuming governance. It's not just them. The special officers commissioned to creating a generation of parasites, leeching off the supremacy's goodwill. The things some of you get up to? If you are soldiers of mine, I'd have you shot. As as he blinked, given the rest of the evening, he hadn't expected the Ascendant General to be so candid in his views. What is the solution? He probed. 
In your mind, I mean. It's all sniffed again. We're drunk on the ideas of mythology and personal glory. Negan Rush, Balte Kojiro. Names like these establish themselves, and so others try to imitate them. People wanting to benefit from the supremacy when it should be the other way around. Hold on. This guy just pull out, ask not what your country can do for he you, does. but what you can do for your country. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> can, wait, can you change his voice to be like JFK now? I cannot, now. <laughs> the other way around? Mizazi raised an eyebrow. Yes, Tall said. He's sniffing too much. He's got a cold. His demeanor had shifted as he taught, slouched relaxation turning into a rigid focus, as if he was now giving a speech to the assembled troops. Supremacy should not be this crowd of competing interests, he growled. That is the UAP's domain. We should be one new nation, singular, concentrated on a single cause, the evolution of the state, for strong masterminds to lead the charge, discipline of the masses, military discipline. That is the only way for the supremacy to survive into the new era. Muzazi blinked at the deluge of information. I, I see. To be honest, that sentiment didn't sell it uh, well with him at all. At no point in his speech had Ascendant General Toll mentioned what would be done with such power, what purpose the evolution of the state would accomplish. It sounded like the pursuit of power for power's sake. Toll was still talking, but he's reverted to his casual tone. As things stand now, alas, the bureaucrats are too deeply entrenched. If we had an, uh, sorry, the, uh... This guy's basically just trying to, like... Oh, hold on, I might have read ahead before I say my thoughts. If we had an, uh, his face shifted. If we had a, uh, pro properly educated, though, one made sympathetic to the military cause, things could be different. What do you think of that? So this is kind of interesting, because on a very surface level, Toll seems similar to Muzazi, but then the more you get into it, you really realize what makes them different. Um, whereas Toll is very much standing from, like, sort of a fashioned, and like you said, like, chasing power for power's sake point of view. Yeah, big Mr. Fascist. Um, uh, Muzazi, we already can see as, like, a more faceted and, like, developed character who's evolved as, like, what would we use power for? How do we right wrongs? Like, he has a very clear moral backbone that seems to be missing from otherwise what he would agree with on a surface level with the rest of these people. Mm. It's very interesting. Muzazi looked up and his golden eyes looked down at him. Ah, so yet another person wanted him to do their dirty work. The distaste must have shown upon his expression as the slightest trace of shame swam across the Ascendant General's face. I may hate the dance officer, he said, almost apologetically, but that doesn't mean I can avoid it. Muzazi looked away. My apologies. I have matters to attend to. Of course, as you were. Okay. Do you know what would really make this story a lot happier? Mm -hmm. If a toy had literally just like one friend. <laughs> or like romantic interest or whatever. Just like one person who wasn't dead and wasn't trying to use him. Just one. Perhaps he will get his. Maybe you can introduce, he has like a cousin we didn't know about. He's like, yo, what's up, a toy? <laughs> Good to see you again, man. Want to smoke weed? Want to go for a walk on Thanksgiving? Can I popcorn oh. to you for this uh, last little bit? Yeah. Uh, we were at a course as you yeah. were, right? A toy Muzazi quickly abandoned the arena as well, finding himself walking the many hallways of the child garden once again. He knew he'd have to return to the party sooner or later. He'd be missed. If he wanted to rise through the ranks, it wouldn't do to be seen as an antisocial malcontent. He clenched his fists in anger as that thought occurred. Even he was part of the shadow game now. Oh no, shadow <laughs> game. Draw your next See, pathetic you... card, Ruzazi. No, <laughs> these saw blades are coming for your kneecaps. <laughs> Damnation. Uh, seeking advantage and deceit and subterfuge. It was like this place had infected him. The days when he had nothing to worry about but where to swing his sword seemed so pleasant now. Off in the Shining Past. He's having a real guts moment. If you've ever read Berserk, like the Golden yeah. Age arc, straight up. As he passed a junction, Muzazi happened to glance off to the side, where he saw them. The walls of this hallway were displaying an ancient castle, and the false shadows of the walls hid the two people conversing from view for a moment. It took Muzazi's eyes only a moment to adjust and recognize the faces. Morgan knocked in a dark purple tuxedo, and the clown of the supremacy himself. Real quick... Castle, because it's the future. 
Do they have like cool future sci-fi castles, or are they like traditional castles? Um, well, it's sort of it's, it's the castle here is sort of generally referred to like a stone structure, but they are like more advanced in terms of structure than what we would consider a castle today. Okay, like architecture, uh, the more weird, <laughs> basically. Gotcha. Wu Ming, the fourth contender, wearing a gaudy pink suit with a collar of what looked like long white feathers. His hair was tied back in a ponytail, and a set of circular sunglasses rested atop his nose. The spectacles, the spectacles, almost comically small for his eyes. I know exactly what you're describing, like those fucking like <laughs> French artist yeah. glasses. He was saying something to Morgan so quietly that it was barely audible. Muzazi hadn't seen Ming since Nocturnus, when the contender had saved him from Dark Star's berserker. He seemed no worse for wear from his battle against the Abyssal Knight. Wu Ming stopped speaking to his protege as Muzazi came into view. Just as you know, um, the E's and protege have to have the funny accent mark on them. The French don't exist anymore. They're safe now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. As Muzazi came into view, instead standing up straight and grinning, he offered Muzazi a friendly wave. Oh, fuck, what was his voice again? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> what do you think his voice Hey, pal! Oh, what? What do you think his voice should be? I remember it being, like, really over the top, so I'm just going to go with that. It was like, Hey, pal! Ten out of ten! He called out. Mind if we talk to you for it? Muzazi kept walking. More secrets, more... Damn, bro! Is that enough? More, se- more secrets, more lies. Not even the castle they schemed in was real. This whole place was suffocating. It's like when you fucking skip the dialogue in a cutscene. <laughs> exactly. It, I like to... I like to imagine, like, he's walking, he's like, hey, pal, cuts off, and then it's, like, loading screen, and then the cutscene continues, and he's talking again, and it skips again, <laughs> and he, like, keeps following him down this, like, whole castle. <laughs> it's like, fucking Muzazi. general, it's like, hey, Muzazi, camera shifts and zooms in. <laughs> it's good to see you, pal, ten out of ten, and then it skips, loading sign. <laughs> Muzazi splashed water from the sink into his face, getting some small measure of relief from the cool water on his face. Sorry. From the cool water on his skin. There you go. See, now you're learning. I've I fucking gotten into your head now. You know the what's cool up. cool water on his skin in my rink. So stupid. A heavy sigh escaped his lips as he hunched over the sink top, stray drops of water falling from his fringe. He was alone in the bathroom. Just him, his thoughts, and his reflection. Muzazi stared at himself in the mirror. He looked unwell. He felt unwell. Was something wrong with him? Surely a merely uncomfortable situation shouldn't have him like this. He could feel an almost physical nausea welling up in his throat, like someone had spun him around a thousand times and let him loose. His hand drifted down to Luminescence's scabbard, where he clutched the hilt for support. If nothing else, he had move, whispered Negan Rush right in his ear. Muzazi whirled around and swung his sword, just in time to deflect the golden arrow that had been aimed for his back. The projectile... Wait, so this guy's real? How else would he have known that there was an arrow coming from Muzazi? Who can say? Muzazi stand, Negan Rush? (laughs) The projectile ricocheted off luminescence and struck the opposite wall where it lodged deep. The sound of singing metal filled the small room. His eyes flicked around, searching for an adversary that was not present. Were they under attack? Blade drawn, he cautiously made his way to the center of the room. The nausea was gone. This was his element. Above, Negan Rush's voice was faint, barely audible, but accurate. Uzazi leaped out of the way as the second arrow speared down from the ceiling, burying itself in the floor and shattering the tile. This time, he saw where it had originated. There was an air vent on the ceiling, with just the tiniest gap, just large enough for one of these arrows to slip through. The situation... How do you have enough t- room in an air vent to pull back a bow, Tan? It's better to be one big-ass air vent. The situation was clear, then. The assault, this assault was aimed at him special, specifically. The arrows were an Aether ability, fired from another part of the Child Garden. They traveled through the vents into... Oh, never mind. I apologize to you. I forgot Aether exists. <laughs> it's like, this second. is unrealistic. There's no way. Well, I was like... <laughs> never mind. They traveled through the vents until they reached this bathroom and completed the attack. This does feel like a stand battle, though. I, was gonna, I thought you were going to say it seems like Among Us. <laughs> No, I mean, he's got his fucking hallucination telling him where attacks are coming. He's, like, figuring out the ability. It's like they're being sent through the air. Through It feels very JoJo-esque. I kind of like it. Muzazi went to evacuate the room, but as he turned his head, he saw another golden glint within the vent. A third arrow was coming. He couldn't look away. With a flare of silver aether, he applied thrusters to the bottom of the broken tile, and it slammed up into the ceiling, serving as a makeshift lid against the vent. As Muzazi pulled the first arrow, vital evidence free from the wall, he heard the discordant sounds of scraping stone and screeching metal from the other side of the barrier. 
was the third arrow spinning like some kind of drill, trying to break through the tile? At any rate, he bought himself the time he needed. Uzazi charged out of the bathroom and right into the party beyond it. The noise from behind him suddenly cut off, his unseen adversary seemingly unwilling to continue their attack. His hand closed, and when he looked down, he saw that the arrow he had been gripping was gone. Dissipated into Aether while his eyes were elsewhere, no doubt. He scanned the faces of- I would have fucking recorded it yourself, Muzazi, so you could reproduce it later. He scanned the faces of the partygoers before him, who kept on eating and drinking and chatting, but saw no traces of guilt. He thought of calling out, but did not. Ill-considered words were wounds here. Oh, Maize Muzazi, you don't think you're on the battlefield? The obvious conclusion could no longer be denied. He was not among friends. He was not among I was us. Also thinking that. <laughs> that was a good chapter. A little exposition heavy, but I think we got to see a really cool sign of Muzazi. And it really made me realize, especially now that we have an arc focused on him without Marie, just how solitary his existence is. He has no real friends, no one he can truly rely on, only his own goals. And this was how he was before Marie as well, and it just makes you really sad for him. And also surprised how tightly he's held onto his moral backbone, all on his own. And it's like, where did he get it from, you know? Like, what is his backstory? What is his background? It makes me want to know more about him. And it also makes me deeply, deeply and genuinely sad for him. Because I can't imagine going through life without at least one friend. Especially going through such harsh circumstances all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's very, very somber and depressing. Um, that said, give me a fun fact and don't you dare tell me to ask a question. Uh, fun fact. Uh, Aeon Stenhouse is a Skurrant. He's actually... Um, well, the Skurrant's properties, of course, are long fingers, the bloodshot eyes. And he is... Basi- dangly limbs. Yeah, dangly limbs. So basically, he is of a type of a scurrent, similar to Helga's that were sort of aesthetically based. So there's no real purpose for these uh, alterations apart from looking... Based cool. to be as like thin and spidery yeah. as possible. Yeah. And in- I kind of got the feeling... I almost wanted to ask you in the middle like if he was a scurrent, but I was like too into the impression of him. You, you, that you voice I was doing... Him. Yeah, what was that voice? It sounded familiar. That was you. you I feel like... I- no, I know, but I like... <laughs> The one I was doing, it felt like something I'd heard before. Was it the Khajiit? It might have been. Maybe like but less catty Khajiit. Yeah. I felt like I was channeling an energy that I had seen before. So in the time of the Gene Terrans, they were sort of dancers, but they dan- they sort of clung to the ceilings and like swayed to make lights behind them do pretty things. Yeah, and then Helga just had her arm changed. Yeah. Well, they were more like a statue. They would just pose, basically. Well, like, look at my arm. Do you like what you see? I was like, ooh, it's see-through. Mm. Uh, now I'm just imagining like horrific, like a Gene Tyrant having like a you know like a high high society art exhibit, but it's like all the fucked up people they oh, made yeah. that have to like stand there on pedestals. Yeah, that that, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. Ah. Uh, oh man. So was Helga directly created by a Gene Tyrant, or is she like a descendant, distant descendant of a more descendants. fucked up? Yeah. So yeah, Helga's probably figured. descended from someone who's all the way see through her body. Yeah. Probably. They've been filling out all the bits. It was good. Oh, Mary. man. I have arms. You have legs. It'll work. <laughs> we'll make a whole person. Oh, man. All right. Well, thank you guys for watching as always, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.